Good morning, everyone. My name is Robert Shapiro. I'm a certified assistant county assessor with the Assessment Review Commission. I would like to thank North Hempstead Receiver of Taxes, Charles Berman, for inviting me to speak with you today to help you learn how to file a grievance online for free without the need to hire a company to do it for you. Before we begin our presentation, I would like to welcome to the microphone North Hempstead Town Supervisor Jennifer DeSena for a few opening remarks. Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see we have so many who have joined us today. I want to thank you, uh, Charles Berman from the Receiver of Taxes to uh, for setting this up. And thank you, Robert Shapiro from Nassau County Assessment Review Commission for helping us this morning. Um, I'm happy to learn with you all today. And um, most important question is this will be recorded. It will be available. So for all of you who are attending who want to tell your friends and neighbors that this was a great program and answered questions, uh, you'll be able to find it on our website. Um, then the second most important question is what is the deadline? May 2nd. So um, with that, thank you so much. And um, uh, I, I hope you all find this helpful and, and please spread the word, check the website and, um, and let's learn. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor DeSena. Now I would like to introduce North Hempstead Receiver of Taxes, Charles Berman, and invite him up to the microphone to welcome you all to this workshop. Mr. Berman. Hi, good morning, everyone. I want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, I am Charles Berman, a Receiver of Taxes for the Town of North Hempstead. Normally we do these live um, every year in the libraries, and um, many of you have come and watched me do the presentation. Um, Today, you're going to learn how to file um, your grievance online directly with the Nassau County Assessment Review Commission. Um, and they are going to give you all the information that you need to do that and show you how to work their website and how to view um, ARROW, which it stands for the Assessment Review on the Web, uh, which is a program that you'll use. Um, remember, it's not the Nassau County Assessment Review Commission that actually sets your assessment. It's the Nassau County Department of Assessment, which is a separate county agency. And there is information on their website too that's very valuable that you uh, may use to file your grievance. So you can actually look up your property. Um, both agencies have a website. And Nassau County Department of Assessments website is on mynassauproperty.com. You should look up your property on mynassaucountyproperty.com before you begin your grievance because there is very important information about your property, especially your property record card. And it also gives you the capability of looking um, in your neighborhood at other assessments of homes that are similar to yours. Um, so that information may be helpful too. Remember, you do have to build a case to file a uh, successful grievance. And, um, you know, basically you're going to either state that there's something wrong on your property record card um, or that the market value that was assigned to your property by Nassau County Department of Assessment is incorrect. But you're really going to have to try to make a case and prove the prove that. So um, in order to do that, you really should know both websites. You should create an account for both websites. Um, they're going to show you in this presentation how to log in and create an account for, for the Nassau County um, Assessment Review Commission website to use Arrow. It's very useful. Um, for further information, though, you could look at um, the last presentation that I did live before the pandemic was in February of 2020. We still have that on the Town of North Hempstead website. If you go to North Hempstead and you go to government and you go to receiver of taxes, you could actually watch that presentation too, where I go in into great detail and depth about both agencies and both websites and how to put this all together to file a very successful challenge. So, um, I wish all of you good luck. It's very, very important that everybody remember to file a challenge to your assessment every single year. Um, after you watch this presentation, you can decide uh, whether you want to do it yourself or if you want to hire somebody to represent you. Um, but you can, as, as Mr. Shapiro said, do it yourself without paying anybody any money. 
Um, what you also should know is that you can file your initial grievance with the Assessment Review Commission on your own. And if you get a bad decision, they're gonna they're gonna contact you, you know, sometime by next Labor Day and let you know what the decision is. If they deny your your um, grievance, then you have the right to uh, to send back the letter they they sent you and tell them you don't agree with it and that you're going to file an appeal. After that, they may contact you and they may start negotiating with you about your assessment. Um, if they don't, then you have the right to file an appeal to the decision. That's called the small claims appeal. Um, it goes uh, to uh, uh, a certain part of Supreme Court. And, um, and what you should know is that that's a little bit more complicated. You really have to have some, some information about how that court works. And um, at that point, you can actually hire somebody to represent you just as SCAR. So you can file your initial uh, grievance on your own, and you could hire somebody to represent you if you decide to file an appeal at SCAR. Or um, you may want to represent yourself pro se if you you know have the expertise so anyway i'm going to turn it back now to um to mr robert shapiro and the assessment review commission to do the presentation again i wish all of you good luck if you have any questions um you can contact our office um at 516-869-7800 or uh, the assessment review commission which i'm sure they'll put up their phone number so um, again, thank you for joining and uh, I wish everyone good luck. Thank you, Mr. Berman. Before we begin, I want to remind everybody to take advantage of the Q&A feature of this online event. If you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A. We will get to as many of them as we can at the end of the presentation. The reason we don't take questions live is there is about a 30 to 40 second delay between when I say and show you things and when you actually hear and see them. So in order to avoid any confusion, we take all the questions at the end. That being said, as you think of your question, don't wait until the end to ask it. Put it right into the Q&A. I have one of my coworkers who's going to be helping me out with the Q&A, and he may be responding to some of these questions um, privately, and then we'll also bring them up at the end because we often get asked the same question um, 20 different ways. So let's get started, shall we? We are the Assessment Review Commission. Our website is www.asknasa.com. You will notice that we have a video as well on our website. It's a six and a half minute version of this presentation. If at any time, especially in the middle of the night when you're doing this, you forget something you've learned, you're not sure about something, that video is always there 24 seven. So in case you have to have like a birdie over your shoulder kind of talking you through this, it's very handy to have that video there. On the right hand side of your screen, you'll see it says ARC 2023-2024 brochure. If you click on that, you will be able to access our brochure, which has all of our contact information, our address, our telephone number, our email address, our website address. On the bottom left of your screen, you'll notice it has the address for the Department of Assessments property search, as Mr. Berman mentioned. In the middle, you'll see it's our calendar, and at the very top, you'll notice that little disclaimer we added because the deadline has been changed from March 1st until May 2nd. You now have until May 2nd to file your appeal. That being said, please do not wait until the last minute. Because if you wait till the last minute and it's a 10 before midnight on May 2nd and the website crashes and you don't get your appeal in time, there was nothing we can do for you. So please, I know you have plenty of time. I know it seems like it's a long time away. File your appeal early. You could always go back and make changes after you think about it and if you want to make any modifications, but please do not wait until the last minute. As Mr. Berman said, we're going to be talking a lot about the ARROW system. It stands for Assessment Review on the Web, and you can get there by one of two ways. 
On the left hand side of the screen, you'll see it says arrow on our homepage. You can click on that or you can go there directly by typing in www.nassaucountyny.gov forward slash arc forward slash arrow. This is the arrow page and this is where you'll be going if you want to file an appeal online by yourself. Now we mentioned before. There are companies that do this. They don't do it for free. They either charge you a flat fee, some charge you a percentage of any savings you may get 20, 30, 40, 50 percent even. We're showing you how to do this for free. There is no reason to hire a company. They don't have any special advantages. They don't have any special tricks. We're going to go through the entire process and explain to you how you can do this yourself. And if you do this yourself and you get a reduction, all the savings go to you. So again, we're going to teach you how to do all this. This is the arrow page. The first thing you'll need to do if you've never been here before is you're going to have to register in the arrow system. So on the left, it says register with ARC. You'll click on that link. It'll open up the registration page and here you're going to have to enter everything that has an asterisk. So your first name, last name, street address, city, zip code, state, phone number. About a third of the way down, it notes ARC is now offering the option of receiving electronic or paper notifications for offers and determinations. That means you have a choice. Do you want to be contacted by regular mail or by email? We strongly recommend email. You often get quicker responses. Things don't get lost in email. Um, every so often, just double check your spam folder to make sure that you're getting the messages. Um, you save a stamp, you save the county money too, which is always good for the taxes because we're not spending money on envelopes and postage and printing and so forth. So online is always the better option for this. You got to enter your email address and double check, make sure it's correct. If you registered before, double check your email address from last year. You want to make sure it's still current. If you filed online last year and you were a Fios uh, subscriber and now you're with Altice or opt online, your email address may have changed. So double check the address, please make sure, because especially if you've chosen online contact, if we have the wrong email address, you're not going to be getting our messages. So please double check that. You're going to choose a user ID and password. It is case sensitive, so be careful when you are choosing that user ID and password. And a great place to write that down so you don't lose it is on the brochure we told you about printing up on the previous page. You're going to read through all these statements below, understand what you are agreeing to, and then choose complete registration. You'll get a confirmation message saying thank you for registering. Please click here to continue. If at this point that's all you want to do, you want to register and then you're set for now. On the left hand side of the screen, it says log out. It's very important, especially if you are using someone else's computer. Many people don't own their own computer. They borrow our friends, they go to the library. Make sure you log out every time you're done. You're also going to get an email from us sent to that email address you put in your registration. It may not look exactly like this, but it should look very similar. Again, if you don't get the confirmation email, double check your spam folder. Make sure the messages from us are not going into your spam folder. Now that you've registered, next time you go to visit Arrow, you will click on the login tab. You'll enter your username and password and you will get to your account homepage. And how will you know if you got into your account? Because if you look towards about two thirds of the way down where it says welcome to Arrow assessment review on the web, it will say your name. In our example, it says John Smith. So now we're going to talk for a while about Sales Locator. ARC has provided a Sales Locator tool to assist you in filling out your application form. Now, Sales Locator can only be used for single family, for two family, or three family homes. It is not able to be used for condos or co ops. What the Sales Locator does is provide you adjusted sale prices of properties that are comparable to yours, and we'll discuss in a little bit what it means to be comparable. And this can help you determine if your property, property is currently overvalued. So if you want to use Sales Locator, what you'll do is first, either at the bottom where it says, do you have a good case for filing an appeal? Or on the left where it says Sales Locator, you're going to click on one of those. 
Now that we're in Sales Locator, the next step is to locate your property. You can do so one of two ways. If you know your section block and lot number, you can search by section block and lot. Most people don't know it or don't know where to find it. I've been working for ARC for three years. I couldn't tell you my section block and lot off the top of my head, so it's not a big deal if you don't know. So we're going to use the address to look for your property. So you start with the house number, putting the street. For this example, it's Christie. Now we're not putting in anything after it. We're not putting street, lane, avenue, court. The reason for that is, say our property is Christie Street, and you typed in Christie Street, S-T-R-E-E-T, -E -E and you hit search. The system has Christie Street in there as Christie, S-T. So if you type out the word street, it's not going to find your property. So just put in the name of the street. Don't put the suffix at the end. Are you going to put city, zip code, and click search? It will locate your property. And when it finds your property, you will click on the parcel ID as we have in the bottom left corner. At this point, it is time to prove that you are an actual person and not a robot. There is a security code in the black box on the left. You will retype that into the white box to the right of it. And then click continue. And if all goes well, you should see your house. And for our example, we see we have 504 Christie Street, Hempstead, New York, 11550. It's a one family home located in the Rockville Center Union Free School District, not in a village, and it's in the town of Hempstead. Let's look over to the right where it says assessment information 2023-2024. That is the current period we are filing for. Appeal period says January 3rd through March 1st, and you'll notice at the top we have a little reminder that appeal period has been extended to May 2nd, 2022. Valuation date, January 3rd. That means the value of your home is based on what it was worth as of January 3rd, 2022. Going to go down towards the bottom. It says taxable market value. That value, in our example, $467,000. That is the current value that the Department of Assessment has valued your home at. And that translates to an assessed value of $467. That's 467. That is what they use when they do the math to figure out what you're paying in taxes. Let's take a look on the left hand side of your screen where it says dwelling information. And we're going to get a little closer on that. You'll see on the left it says styles of cape. The style is a cape. Your built is 1954. Lot size 7735. Living area is 1,332 square feet. We have two full baths, one half bath, one car garage, and a basement. Now, if any of that information is incorrect, you do have the option to change that in sales locator. You would click where it says change values. It would allow you to make changes. In our example, we're changing it from two full baths to one full bath, and then you would click apply changes. And for the rest of the time using sales locator, it would take that corrected information and use it throughout. It's important to understand if you make a change in sales locator, that change is only in sales locator. It does not change the permanent record. So if you have a mistake, in your property record. Say the county has it that you have seven full bathrooms and you only have two. And you don't want them to think you have seven because they're going to value your home based on seven bathrooms. You would contact Department of Assessment 516-571-1500. And if it's something inside your home, they would more than likely send an inspector there to confirm the correct information. If it's something external, say a garage, at that point they would probably just have somebody drive by your home, take a photo and see that the garage is or is not there. We often get asked at this point, well, if I call them because they think I have seven bathrooms and I only have two and they come to my house, will they see the three illegal kitchens I have in my house? Well, as Mr. Berman mentioned, Department of Assessment and the Assessment Review Commission are two separate departments. We can't speak for each other. That being said, I cannot guarantee you that if an inspector comes to your home to see something you want them to see, they may not. They may also see things 
you don't want them to see. So it's entirely up to you whether you think it's in your best interest to have an inspector come to your home to make a correction to your property card. We're going to continue by clicking on find sales on the left hand side. And now you will see it's got a list of properties at the very top is our subject, so it's there for an easy comparison. These sales are all located in the same school district. You'll notice that there are multiple towns, Hempstead, South Hempstead, Rockville Center. It searches by school district because a major factor when people are looking to buy a home is school district, not only for the quality of the education, but for how much you'll be paying in school taxes. So the radius search goes out from closest to further away. So as you go down your screen, it's showing you sales that are further away from your home. And the sales it looks for typically within the 12 to 18 months range. When you're looking, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're looking for comparable sales, you're looking for sales that are most similar to yours. You're looking for sales that if you were selling your home in the market and somebody wanted to buy your house, but it wasn't available anymore, what other homes would they say, well, I can't buy this house. This house is pretty similar. Let's buy that one instead. So you'll be looking for homes that are capes first. And then you'll look to see if it's a cave that's similar in living area or lot size and age. If you're able to find homes similar to yours like that, then you choose those as sales. If you can't find homes that are similar in style, perhaps you choose a ranch that's similar in square footage or a small colonial. You do the best you can with what's there. You're not always going to find the perfect comparable sale. In general, if you're trying to prove that you're over assessed, you're going to be looking for homes that have sold for lower than yours. Although some sales that sold for higher but are superior, they're much larger and so forth, may prove your case. So don't just discount sales that sold for a little bit higher than you're currently assessed. When you're looking for sales, you're looking for market sales for arm's length transactions. And what does that mean? A market sale means you have a person who's looking to sell their house for as much as they can. You have a person looking to buy the house for as little as they can. They negotiate, they come up with an actual price and complete the transaction. That's a market sale. What's not a market sale? A foreclosure. When a bank forecloses on a property, they often sell it for much lower than it's worth on the open market because they just want to be rid of it. They don't want to own the property. They want money back. So they'll sell it for a lot less. Um, an estate sale will often sell for below market because someone passes away, the kids don't want the house, they just want to sell it and get the money, so they'll sell it below market. Um, a family sale. If a parent is selling to their children, unless the children were really bad when they were kids, they usually give them a good break on the price. Those aren't market sales. Now you'll notice on your screen that it doesn't say market sale, estate sale. So how are you supposed to know? When you're looking at the sales, you'll notice most of the sales tend to be in a range. On a screen, basically the range is the low 400,000s to the high 500,000s. So if most of the homes are selling in that area and you see a home that sold for $250,000, more than likely that wasn't a market sale. Now we can't stop you from putting that in there as a comparable sale into your appeal. However, when the appraiser who has assigned your case looks at your comparable sales and they see 450, 475, 525, 250, they're gonna say, hmm, something's wrong with that 250, let's do some research. They're going to realize it wasn't a market sale and they will not take that sale into consideration as part of their analysis. So, well, we can't stop you from putting a non-market sale in there, more than likely it's not gonna help your case. So as part of sales locator, you are allowed to include five comparable sales. You can choose more later on in the application, but sales locator only allows you to choose five. At this point, we are often asked, well, what's the magic number? How many sales do I need to get a reduction? There is no magic number. If you find one or two really good comparable sales that support a reduction, then one or two is your magic number. If you need three to five sales to help your case, then choose three to five. 
typically if you can't prove your case in three to five sales, overloading us with seven to 10 sales isn't going to help. So if you can't find comparable sales within three to five sales to help your case, then maybe comparable sales isn't the way you're going to prove that you are due a reduction. But again, you could choose up to five. So in our example, you'll see on the left hand side, we have selected three properties and you do that by using the check boxes. Once you've chosen those properties on the left hand side in the bottom, it says select check properties and continue. We will do that. And now you will see we have our subject on the left hand side and we have cell one, cell two and cell three in columns alongside. it. We're going to concentrate on sale one and you'll go down. You'll notice the address is 1171 Hempstead Avenue. It's in the same area, same school district as our subject. It was sold. January of 2021 for $450,000. If you keep going down, it's a Cape. It's very similar in age to our subject. It's not a waterfront property. So far, so good. Now you'll see it says adjustments. At this point, what the computer does automatically is make adjustments. It accounts for differences between your home and the comparable sales you've chosen because we don't expect you to be able to find homes that are exactly the same as yours in terms of lot size, square footage of the home, bathroom counts, and so forth. So the computer makes adjustments to account for this. So you'll notice our lot size is 7735. Sale one, the lot size, the property size, is about 1300 square feet smaller. So the computer has added value to account for the difference between what the sale has and what we have in terms of property size. If you go nine and a half bathrooms, we have one and a half bath, sale one didn't have a half bath. So the computer has determined that a half bath in this area is worth $5,000 and has added that value to the sale. Same thing for living area. It takes the difference, it calculates what that's worth and adds value. So after adjustments, a home that sold for $450,000 if it had been more similar to our subject in terms of lot size, bathroom counts, square footage, would have sold for almost $466,000. That's how the adjustments work. And it does it for sale two and sale three. Now at the bottom of the screen, you'll notice it says wait. By default, the computer, when you have a certain number of sales, does a simple average. If you have three sales, it takes the three sales, adds the adjusted prices, divides by three. If you have four sales, adds all four, divides by four. What weight allows you to do is change the math. If you were looking at these three sales and you decide one of these sales is, that's your sale, that's the sale that's really gonna prove your case. The other two are okay, but sale one, that's the home run. Where it says weight, you can change the math and you can make the weight for that first sale 50% and sales two and three, 25% each because you'll make the math equal 100. <clears throat> it's kind of like when you're in school and you have an average and then you have a weighted average for tougher classes. It's the same principle. So you have that option to change the weight if you think that's going to help you make your case. We're going to keep this the way it is. We're going to click on continue. And before you go any further, you have to acknowledge that the sales locator, it's not an appraisal. It's not an opinion on the value of your property by the Assessment Review Commission. You need to read through the disclaimer and click I agree proceed. After you do so, you will get the results for your selected sales. Now in our example, you'll notice the weight adjusted sale price and the average adjusted sale price are pretty similar because we didn't change the weight. But if we had changed the weight on those sales, then you would notice that the weighted sale price and the average sale price are different. And as a reminder, you see it says taxable market value. That is what the Department of Assessment is currently valuing your home at. So based on what you see here, it looks like the assessment's pretty fair and the sales are showing that it's a pretty fair assessment. Does that mean you can't continue? Absolutely not. Sales are not required to prove your case for an appeal. So regardless of what happens in sales locator, you don't have to use that information to continue. So we're going to say we want to continue to submit an appeal. 
We're now going to get to the actual form part of your application. First thing you're going to do is choose the right form. For most of you, it's going to be the AR1. That is for one family, two family, three family homes, or for low rise condos. So since most people use AR1, we're going to use the AR1 as our example. Just to let you know, so it doesn't surprise you, when you use Sales Locator and then go into your application, the data from part from your um, Sales Locator will go automatically into Part E, and the sales you chose will automatically go into Part E. You are not required to keep that information, and you'll be able to change it. But I didn't want you to be surprised if all of a sudden you go there and parts of your application are already filled out. One last thing, and I talked before about having an angel on your shoulder as you do this to kind of guide you as you go through. There are question marks throughout this application form. They are white surrounded by a blue circle. If you are ever in doubt as to what is being asked of you, you can put your mouse over the question mark and a little box will pop up and give you additional information. So in our example, you put your mouse over the question mark and for taxpayer applicant name, it's trying to tell you if you own the house, write your name. If you're filing for a relative who owns the house, write that person's name and so forth. So whenever you're not sure what they're asking you for, put your mouse over the question mark. You don't even have to click and it will give you some information. OK. Part A is required from a sales locator, the parcel ID, the address, and the person's name on the roll are automatically in your application. Taxpayer applicant's name, that's typically going to be you. Other owner's names, if you own the house with a spouse, this is where you would put your spouse's name. If you own the house with brothers and sisters, put their names down. It's very important to put someone else's name on the application, especially for this very important reason. If your spouse is on the roll, but you don't put your spouse on the application, if your spouse calls our office and says, I want to talk to you about our appeal, and they're not on the application, our staff cannot speak to them. They have to be on the application. So if it's a husband and wife who own the property, the wife fills out the application. She doesn't put her husband's name on there where it says other owners' names. And the husband calls us and says, I want to talk to you about the appeal. Our staff says, I'm sorry, but we can only speak to your wife. So to avoid any problems at home, arguments and so forth, please put your spouse or other owners on the appeal form mm -hmm. part A where it says other owners names. You're going to choose the form. For most of you, it's going to be individual. And then we'll continue. Part B is also required. You're going to select whether the property is offered for sale or under contract. Actually, before we get to that, excuse me. Where it says applicant estimates and request that the assessment be reduced based on the full market value of. Now, if you use sales locator, that gets added automatically. It's the weighted adjusted price. So in this case, it's 466, 896. Now, if you'll remember, our current assessment is $467,000. So requesting a value of $14 below that is not going to help you. So you can erase that, put in a different figure. Maybe you think your house is actually worth $400,000. You would put $400,000 in there. There's no dollar sign, no decimal points, just 400, 000. Now below that, it's going to ask you whether you have the house on the market, if it's offered for sale, if it's in contract. If it is, you would choose yes and enter the price. The reason we're asking that is if your home is being sold currently, it's typically being sold at market value. That's often a good example of what your market value is. So if you're being assessed for $550,000, but your home is on the open market and you're listing it for $450,000, that might be good support that you're being over assessed. And that's why we asked that question. Part C is the easiest part of the application. There's nothing to do. Representative type of self, you continue on. Okay, part D. Part D is entirely optional. And I love this part of my job because I get excited about part D. 
And I know it strains and I'm getting part of that excited about part of an application to lower your assessed value, but this part D is a major reason of why we tell you to do this yourself and not hire a company. You are your best advocate. Nobody knows your home better than you. Nobody knows your neighborhood better than you. A company that's doing thousands of these, there's no way they know the intricacies of your block like you do. So part D, again, entirely optional, but asks a variety of questions about your home, about the area. I wanna focus on the questions at the bottom third, where it asks, are any of these adjacent to or visible from the house? None of these are cut and dry. Don't assume, well, if I check that, my value is gonna be higher or lower, so forth. None of this is cut and dry. Let's take the first one, waterfront. Well, you may be thinking, if my house is on the water, it must be worth more. I don't wanna tell them I'm on the water. Well, first off, we look at maps, so we see if you're on the water. But just because you're on the water doesn't mean that's a, a positive thing. If you're on the North Shore of Long Island, and the water's nice and calm, and you have these beautiful sunsets, then yes, being on the water is probably gonna add value to your home. But if you're on the South Shore, and every time it rains like a half inch, the water comes up over the canal, floods your backyard, and floods your basement. Being on the waterfront doesn't sound so great, does it? We don't know these things by looking at a map. You know these things because you live in that house. So check waterfront where it says other facts, type in, I live on the water, and because I do so, every time it rains, my house floods. If you have pictures from the last time it flooded, take a picture. You'll be able to show it to us. Again, none of these is cut and dry. Railroad, is it good or bad to be by a railroad? Well, if you're close to a railroad, there may be additional noise that could be seen as a negative, or maybe you're in a neighborhood that's popular for commuters because you can just keep the car at home and walk to the train station. Again, nothing is cut and dry. Let's go down to where it says street with a painted center line or other traffic separation. Double yellow line usually means busy road. But can your road be busy if there's no painted yellow line? Well, let's look at it this way. If you live close to Hempstead Turnpike, it's pretty obvious you may have you know noise or traffic issues. But what may not be obvious is you're close enough to Hempstead Turnpike that all the locals know that your street is a great shortcut. They could hop onto your street, zip down the block, bypass seven or eight lights, and save five minutes, especially during rush hour. That's not obvious on a map. You know because you live there. So tell us about that in other facts. Tell us that people use my street as a shortcut and I have all this extra traffic that I didn't know I was going to have when I moved there. Let us know. Are you by a school? Well, if you're close to a school, maybe you have bus noise and extra traffic in the morning and afternoon or noise from football games on weekends. But you may be a few blocks away from a school, so you may think, well, the school doesn't affect me. Except all the other blocks close to the school have no parking signs during school time hours. Your block is the first one that doesn't, so all the kids park in front of your house during school days. Not obvious, not on a map. How would we know that? You know that. Tell us about those things. That's the mindset you have to have. When you're filling out Part D, you have to think, if I were to sell my home, what would people say to me? Well, I don't want to pay that much because you're on a busy road. You're close to a commercial property. You're near a golf course, and I don't like people with strange pants hitting golf balls through my window. Whatever the case may be, think about it in that way. Fill out Part D. Again, it's entirely optional, but especially if you can't find comparable sales to support a reduction, Part D can often be your saving grace. Part E. Part E is optional. Yes, comparable sales are optional. You are not required to provide any comparable sales as part of your appeal. Now, you'll notice the sales from Sales Locator are here already. If you like them, great. If you don't like them and want to get rid of them, on the left-hand side, it says delete the parcel. You can delete one, two, or all three of them. Maybe you want to keep them, but you want to add some comments. You found out some information. So where it says comments, maybe for that first sale, you can type in, it's got a granite kitchen, it's got important marble floors, it's got a brand new pool, 
whatever the case may be. Those are for comments. If you want to add a sale, at the bottom you'll notice there's a blank section. You can click on the magnifying glass, search for the sale that you've located from another source, and I'll explain about that in a second. You would click find the parcel, and then you would manually enter the sale date, the sale price, and in comments say, I found this on Zillow, I got this from a realtor. Now, where else can you find sales if not sales locator? Like I mentioned, Zillow, Realtor.com, perhaps Street Easy. A great resource to find comparable sales is a local realtor. We all get those things in the mail. My name is so and so. I've sold 8,000 houses in the area. I am the expert. Well, call the expert and say, I'm not looking to sell right now, but I'm hoping you can give me five minutes of your time. Help me find a couple of comparable sales for my appeal. There's a good chance they're going to say yes, because in the future, when you go to sell your house, you're going to remember that nice realtor who helped you and perhaps give them the listing. So again, you can find sales on your own, but sales are not required, which is why part E is entirely optional. Part F is required. We have another security box there to make sure you have not turned into a robot while you started this. Again, type the numbers from the black box into the white box. You're gonna read through all those certification statements. Make sure you understand what you are agreeing to. You're gonna choose the proper signatory certification. For most of you, it is owner of record. And then just one time, you're going to click submit the application form. If you click it more than once, you may end up submitting the application more than once. And if you have multiple applications in the system, none of them will get processed until we delete all the extra ones. If you have more than one appeal in the system, none of them will get read. So it's very important. Click once. Give it a chance to go through. If you made a mistake or multiple mistakes, this system will tell you about it. So you'll see here it says errors found in part A, errors found in part B, and below it shows you where those actual errors are. So in part A, it says we forgot a taxpayer applicant's name. We forgot to choose the right form. You would click on the appropriate boxes, make those corrections, and for each part, you would click submit changes. So you make the corrections in part A, submit the changes, Go to part B, it says we're missing a market value. You'd put the market value in, click on submit changes for that part. Once you get everything correct, you will get a confirmation message on your screen letting you know that it's all been accepted. You will get the application number. A great place to write that application number is on the brochure we told you about. It's very handy, especially if you have to call customer service. If you give them the application number, it makes it easy for them to find your appeal. You're also going to get an email confirmation with that application number as well. As before, if you don't get the email, double check your spam. OK, so at this point, you have the option to return to the home page. If you're all done, you could submit another appeal in the same way, or you could view or add attachments to your appeal. Now, why would I view or add attachments? Well, before we asked you in Part B, if your house is under the contract or it's listing for sale, if that's the case, you want to either send us a copy of the contract to sell as proof or a copy of the multiple listing, you can do that. If you have photos, if there's damage to your home, I mentioned if your house floods during a rainstorm, take a photo and send it to us. If you did a refinance in the last six months and you have a copy of the appraisal, send us the appraisal. So you can send us the attachments by clicking on view or add attachments. Mm -hmm. It's going to ask you, would you like to add one now? We will say yes. Now, at this point, a pop up window will appear to upload the attachment. You're going to click where it says choose file. You're going to navigate to the attachment and double click on it like you would an email. You're going to choose the document type from a drop down list. It could be an appraisal report. It could be contract of sale, it could be photos. If none of those apply, choose other documents. And then you will click submit attachment. And once you do so, you will notice in the middle of the screen, we now have an a attachment there. Now, if you ended up attaching the wrong document, and sometimes that happens, you can click delete the document and get rid of it. You can add additional documents by using the upload new document key again, or you could just return to the appeal form by clicking return to the appeal form. 
It's very important. You can add attachments by yourself online up until the filing due date, which is May 2nd. After that, if you want to either attach or delete something from your filing, our staff needs to do it for you. So you would send it into our offices, Assessment Review Commission, 240 Old Country Road, 5th floor, Mineola, New York, 11501, Attention Residential Supervisor. You can also drop it off at our offices. We'll scan that for you and then we'll attach it to your appeal for you. But again, once the deadline is passed, once May 2nd is passed, you will not be able to add any attachments or delete them on your own. We'll have to contact our staff to do it for you. After clicking return to the appeal form when all your documentation has been uploaded, you will see that the application has been received by ARC. You'll see status on the right towards the bottom and it says received. At this point, you can click on the arrow home tab to go back to the home page. If you're all set, log out by clicking on log out. You can go back and check your application anytime. On the left, you'll notice it says appeal filing, status, change. You click on that tab, it'll give you the chance to go back and check all that stuff. So that is how you do this with Sales Locator. But what if you don't want to use Sales Locator? What if you have sales from another source, you want to skip it? It's a very similar process. We're going to go a little faster because there's a lot of repetition from what we just did. But if you have any questions, again, Q&A feature is there. Please take advantage of it. OK, so if you're not using Sales Locator, on the left hand side, it says file and appeal or at the bottom it says file and appeal online. Choose either one of those. You're gonna choose the right form. Again, for most of you, for a single family, two family, or three family home, it will be the AR1 form, which we will choose for our example. Now, part A is required. Since we didn't use sales locator, we have to locate our property. So like before, you can either search by parcel ID, or most of you are going to use your address again, house number, house, excuse me, um, street name with nothing after it. So there's Christie, town, zip code, click search, locate the property, and on parcel ID, you're going to click. Part A has our parcel ID, our address, and our name on the roll. You're going to enter the taxpayer applicant's name, other owner's names as in before, and choose the proper form for most of you will be individual. Now, Part B is blank because we didn't use sales locator, so you have to enter a full market value. Now, obviously, you're looking to get a reduction, so if you're being assessed for $467,000, you're going to choose a value that's below that. How much below that? That's entirely up to you. You can choose $400,000. If you think it's worth $350,000, then put that number in there. Whatever you think your house would sell for on the open market, that's the number you would put in as your estimate of full market value. As before, if your property is either offered for sale or under contract, choose yes and enter the price. Part C is still the easiest, still nothing to do here. Part D is still optional. I've told you why I love Part D. I have told you why it's strange that I love part of our application, but I do. Fill out as much of Part D or as little or none at all as you want. It's entirely optional. But again, my feeling is, as your strongest advocate being you, fill out Part D, take the time. You can really make some great points to help your case. Part E, still optional. You do not have to give us any sales in your application form. If you choose to do so, you can click on the magnifying glass and add those sales manually. By the way, each time you add a new sale, a brand new blank one opens up underneath it. So you're not limited by the four you sold before, that you saw before or the one you see now. Each time you fill in the blanks, a new blank one opens up right below it. Part F, still required. Enter that security code, read through the statement to make sure you understand what you are agreeing to. Choose the proper signatory certification and click once a submit application form. <clears throat> As before, it will point out any errors you have made, if you make any. Remember you are submitting changes to each individual part you are not resubmitting the entire form over again it's very important about that once you get the form submitted you will get the confirmation message with the application number you will also get the confirmation email 
you ever want to make any changes to your filing, you can do so. You can click where it says appeal filing status change. You would click on that. Now you may have to locate your appeal, especially if you have multiple appeals. You can search by parcel ID, by tax year. If you kept that application number, you could search by the application number. You would search for the appeals, locate yours, click on the application number, and you could submit changes. In our example, we have part B. We want to make a change. Maybe we want to change that 460 to a 400,000. You can do so. Just make the change and then click submit changes for that part. Again, changes and additions can only be made up until the filing deadline. Filing deadline is May 2nd. Adding additional documents to your appeal <laughs> at any time. If you want to add documents, you would click on the link where it says ARC communications slash attachments. And then you can upload a document the same way you did before by clicking on upload new documents. Or if you need to delete a document, you can click where it says delete. Last thing, withdrawing your appeal. As I mentioned, you can only have one appeal on file. If you have multiple appeals, neither one will be reviewed until you get rid of one of them. Now, what's nice thing about the system, and I didn't know until I learned from doing one of these seminars, is there is a warning that if you go to submit the appeal and you already have one on file, it will tell you that there already is one on file, so it helps you not submit more than one. But if for some reason you have to withdraw one of your appeals, you can do so. You'll notice on the left hand side there's an icon that says withdraw the appeal. You first need to make sure your pop up blockers are turned off. Then you click on withdraw appeal. The message will appear. You're going to read through the statement, understand what you are agreeing to, understand that if you withdraw the appeal, you can't undo that. And if you delete it and you shouldn't have, you're going to have to start all over again. You will click where it says I have read the terms of the agreement. You will click I agree. And you'll notice on the right status it says withdrawn. And believe it or not, we have gone through the entire presentation. It is time to answer your questions. I am going to invite my colleague Jason, who is with our customer service department, to join into the conversation. Uh, Mr. Berman, anything you want to add, just feel free to jump in at any time by unmuting your microphone. We are going to handle some of these questions. Um, and Mr. Berman, if you see something you want to address specifically, just let us know and you're more than welcome to um, jump on in. OK, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you again. My name is Jason. I'm a customer service representative with the Assessment Review Commission of Nassau County, uh, one of Rob's colleagues. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Berman for inviting us to be here today. Uh, we're going to start going through some of the, the many, many questions that uh, you all have been nice enough to send to us. Um, but before I do that, I'm, I'm going to define the, uh, the roadmap for us. Because Rob and I work for the county uh, and work for a specific county department, the county does require us to stay in our lane. So that means that the questions we are going to focus on are going to be questions that the Assessment Review Commission actually handles. Uh, so questions about your appeal. Uh, we won't take any questions about taxes or exemptions or SCAR. All those things are handled by other departments and we have to refer you to the appropriate departments for those questions. So real quick, what I'm going to do is do a blanket referral for those issues. Uh, and give everyone the information to reach out to those departments. So the Nassau County Department of Assessment would handle any questions that you had about taxes, a difference in your bill to someone else's bill, your assessment to someone else's, uh, or any questions about exemptions, such as a STAR exemption or a senior citizen's exemption. To get a hold of the Nassau County Department of Assessment, you're going to call 516-571-1500. You're not going to press any options or extensions. Hold the line all the way until the end. And that's how you reach the Department of Assessment, taxes, exemptions, etc. cetera. Uh, if you had a question about SCAR, SCAR is the second appeal that happens after the Assessment Review Commission appeal that the, uh, Mr. Berman mentioned earlier. Uh, 
questions about SCAR would have to call Nassau County Clerk's Office. Uh, Rob, can you find the clerk's office? For me yes, right? absolutely. Uh, Nassau County Clerk will process your application for SCAR and will take your $30 payment. However, SCAR, as Mr. Berman mentioned, is a Supreme Court uh, filing. You're actually suing the county when you do SCAR. So there is not a single county employee that's allowed to help you by answering questions about the SCAR process. The county doesn't let the county employees help you sue the county, unfortunately. Uh, once Rob gets the number of the county clerk, I'll ask him to uh, speak that out for us. Be able to find? I'm looking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, everybody. Uh, okay. While we're waiting for that, we're just going to go and start talking about some of the other questions that we have. And thank you very much, everyone. We've got tons and tons of questions. We've had 175 attendees with us today. That's great. We're really happy that you came to uh, uh, go through this presentation with Mr. Berman and us today. And uh, us today. So the most common question we get is, can you view this presentation later? And the answer is yes. There's two methods that you can do that. There is a short version of the presentation on our website, www.askarknassau.com. Uh, and Rob, uh, where would the, the attendees find the link to the presentation we did today? I believe what we're going to do is actually have the um, link posted on the Town of North Hempstead website. Mr. Berman, is that correct? That's the plan? We'll have it posted on your website? Yes. Yes. All right, so yes. what we'll do is if you give us some time, we'll probably have that um, posted on the tax receivers page, I'm guessing, where that's where your other video was hosted, correct? Yes. Okay, great. Then we will do that. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that the county clerk's phone number is 571-2660. That is being posted in the Q&A as we speak. So if you have any questions, you can reach out. Also, in the Q&A, we posted a lot of our contact information, our website address, our phone number, our email address. There is a direct link to download that brochure we spoke about. That is also in the Q&A. And contact info for the Department of Assessment as well as a link to a form that you can contact them directly is all in the Q&A. So please make sure you take a look at that. Okay, this is a, uh, a very common question and I, I'm going to address it. Uh, this question is, is the appeal for the general or school taxes or both? So actually I'm going to correct everyone. Um, that is a very common misconception. I understand why that misconception exists because of uh, maybe advertisements we see or mailings we get. Uh, however, this is an appeal to the assessment, not to the taxes. The appeal to the assessment, if successful, can indeed save you money on your taxes, but that is based on the year in question, not necessarily one year compared to a different year. So you, what you're appealing here, everyone, is you're appealing your assessment, which is one part of the equation that completes your bill. If you want to write this down, this is how I explain it to people. A times R is a dollar sign. That means assessment times tax rate equals your bill. You're appealing your assessment. You don't get to appeal your bill. That's not a thing. And if you want to appeal your tax rate, that means you have to uh, vote appropriately for people that will set budgets with the taxing authorities that get taxed. But we're going to focus today on appealing the assessment. Along those lines, I wanted to uh, remind everybody because this question comes up a lot. If you file an appeal, we often get asked, can it result in an increase in your assessment? The answer is no. If you file an appeal, you can either A, be told that there is no case for a reduction, will be left where it is, or B, offer a reduction. And then you have a choice whether to accept it or not but there is not going to be any increase as a direct result of you filing an appeal. And also, as Jason mentioned, each year is separately. So if you get a reduction this year, it doesn't mean you're going to pay less taxes as compared to last year. What it does mean is if you get a reduction, it means you will pay less this year than you would have paid if you didn't get a reduction. So it's a comparison to that current 
point. It doesn't go from year to year. Okay. So uh, this is a good question, and I'd like to cover it for the benefit of everyone. If you're married, would you still choose individual and add your spouse's name in the other owner's text box? The answer is yes. Um, even if you're a couple filling this form out together, that would be filing as an individual. Um, we do think it's pretty important uh, if you have a spouse or a co-owner that might be interested in asking questions about the appeal, that you, you put, put their name, name in, the rules, uh, in the their owner's box. You want to save yourself an argument after dinner uh, because the appeal is legally owned by the individual who files the appeal. So, so if you only put your name, you are the only one that we can speak to about the appeal. You can't speak to the media, you can speak to your legislator, we can't speak to your spouse. You can, can only, only speak to you about, about the appeal. This is why if uh, you have in the past used a third party, party to appeal, to appeal on, on your behalf. behalf. We can't speak to you about that appeal that they did, they did for you. Because because they, filed they filed, they, they legally own, own the appeal, and we have to refer your questions to them. So, so let's uh, move on to some of the other questions. Absolutely. Uh, someone asked under the adding attachments, uh, there was a part of the drop down that said maps. Why would someone want to include a map? What would be a reason for using that? Uh, and what I would answer that question would be to say, uh, perhaps you wanted to show us a map uh, with your home and uh, visually explain something that's a contextual influence to your property. Something, something like, like Rob mentioned, mentioned, whether it be waterfront or whether it be, you know, people using your roads as a cut through between, between major roads. roads. Um, that could that could be a reason that you might, might want to use a map. Absolutely. And along the same line, I see a question about um, that they keep on grieving their assessment um, based on location influence because their backyard borders a commercial property, but they always get denied. Um, there is a chance that the, and more than likely what is happening is your assessment is already taking this into consideration. Um, one way to confirm this, and it's not always the case, but if you look in the My NASA Property Dot com website and you look at your property, oftentimes it will mention a major locational influence, whether you're on a major strip, whether you're near commercial, it can mention that in mynaturalproperty.com. And if it does, then you know that it's already being taken into consideration. That doesn't mean you shouldn't put it in every year because again, just because it's been taken into consideration doesn't mean the full impact has been taken into consideration, and perhaps someone reviewing your appeal will feel that it's not be taken to its full impact and maybe make a reduction based on the location. So I would definitely put it in there, even if you put it in every year and you've only gotten a, you've only gotten denied at this point. Thank you, Rob. Uh, someone asked, is, is it possible to cancel a request that a third party file an appeal for me for this year? And the answer is yes. Uh, but you can't do it with the assessment review. You would have to actually reach out to the contractor, vendor, or third party that you had uh, worked with and, and advise them that you want them to cancel their appeal. So yes, you can do that. Another question that we had is about Part D. Uh, can we have to fill in the entire section completely? And the answer is no. Part D is optional. So you can fill in as much or as little as you like and you can uh, fill in the information that you believe helps prove your case that you are over assessed. We've had another question about an exemption SAR. You're going to have to speak to the Nassau County Department of Assessment 516-571-1500. Uh, call them, don't press any options, hold till the end. Let us see. I saw a question that probably is up my alley because I'm one of the appraisers that actually reviews these challenges. Um, someone was asking about to whether a colonial or a Tudor is more expensive than a ranch and how to make a price adjustment. Something in terms of the style of home, part of the reason we tell you to stay with a certain style is because buyers are often looking at a specific type of home. Um, if you're looking for a ranch because you only want to have one floor, then the likelihood of that same buyer looking for a colonial or a Tudor 
is pretty small because that's a two story home. In terms of so what's, what's more expensive, expensive a colonial or a Tudor, it's tough to make that call as a generality. You have to kind of look, look around and you should be able to see from the comparable sales that get listed to you. Generally, what homes are selling for more or maybe from your research with Zillow or even speak to a realtor if you're not sure, but you can get a pretty good idea, but it's not a hard and fast rule because again, again different, different buyers have different wants and different needs. Along the same lines, we often get asked about how a house next door impacts you if your home is 50 years old, the house next door is due construction. And to that I say, I don't care if a house is located right next to yours. If your house is a 50 year old ranch, a thousand square feet, and the house next door that's sold is a brand new construction, 3,000 square foot home, that's not a comparable. It's next to your home, it's not a comparable because the same buyer who's looking to buy a brand new home that's 3,000 square feet is not looking to the buyer house that's a thousand square feet. It's just not the same buyer. So that's a legitimate reason to, to not use a house that in close proximity to yours. And it's not a case of well, someone goes, well, you're avoiding using that sale because it wouldn't help you. No, you're not using that sale because it's not a valid comparable. Again, you have to have the mindset. If somebody wanted to buy my house and it wasn't available, what other houses would they choose in the area? And more about likely, if your house is a thousand square foot ranch with three bedrooms, they're not going to sell well, I can't get your house. I'll get this house at three times the price, three times the size. Um, the other part of that question was about making adjustments. You do have the option to make some adjustments in sales locator. If you look on the screen about three lines up from the bottom where it says adjust the price, well, it says, View, edit, custom adjustment. You do have the option to make custom adjustments. Most folks don't because they're not appraisers and it gets a little confusing, but you do have the option. You don't feel the bathroom adjustment is enough in your neighborhood, or you want to make another adjustment that's not included there. You have the option by clicking on view, edit, custom adjustments. So it is there as an option in this part of sales. Okay. Uh, let's let's cover some of these other ones. Uh, someone asked uh, if they have used a third party in the past to file for them. Uh, could they stop using a third party and begin filing on their own? And the answer is yes. You can start filing on your own for this year, which is the 2324 appeal. Uh, and you can go ahead and do that by filing as we've gone over today by filing on Arrow. Another question was, uh, is there a way to have access to appeals from the previous years? If you start, start filing on Arrow or have filed, filed on Arrow in the past, uh, any of appeal, appeal filing that you have done through the system will stay in the system and you'll always be able to view appeals that you have filed through Arrow. Now, appeals that you have filed on paper, uh, we give you copies of those when you turn those in. Uh, and appeals that have been filed through a third party, you would have to contact the third party for a copy. We had a question, actually multiple questions, about the condition of the home as compared to the comparables. What I will say about that is typically we don't know the condition of your home. And when we look at comparable sales, we tend to look at comparables that are in a range. <clears throat> homes that have been renovated, homes that have not really been updated, homes that have been renovated a lot. And we kind of take a general average of those or depending on what we see with your home, um, maybe lean one way or the other. Because again, we haven't been inside your home, so we typically don't know the condition of your home. In terms of an actual adjustment, we typically don't make it a, a specific adjustment because again, due to that lack of, of firsthand knowledge of doing the condition of your home, whether you've had it renovated or whether the kitchen is, you know, 50 years old and so forth. So again, we'll look at other comparables in the area and try to take some of the good in terms of renovations, some of the ones that have been renovated and so forth and, and account that way. But if there's anything specific you want us to know about your home, put it in part D, type up a word document, send us some photos, let us know. If it's something major that you think really would impact 
if your home has like you know cracks in the foundation and things like that, contact the um, Department of Assessment and see if they'll send an inspector out to take a look at your home. Let's see. Um, I filed myself followed these steps every year, but have not had reduction for the past two years. That's it. Well, again. We're looking at each year separately. Um, when the uh, values are set by the Department of Assessment, they may be close to what you think they are. They may be slightly off. Um, they may think that the number is close enough that you may be entitled to a slight reduction, but the reduction is negligible and may not have an impact on, you know, taxes and so forth because the assessed value change would be you know, from like 499 to 495, it's not really going to make a difference. Um, all I could say is keep doing what you're doing. It may just be that you're assessed there. And I know some people don't want to hear that, but the fact is the numbers have been getting better in terms of more accurate. And, you know, when we look at things, and this comes up a lot too, because people ask, well, do the companies have an unfair advantage? We look at properties. We don't look at who sent these in. If we look at the data and your house is entitled to a reduction, then we offer a reduction. Doesn't matter whether it comes from you or comes from a company. So it's based on the data, it's based on the location, it's based on the information you give us. And I can't stress enough. I review so many applications where people just send it in. They don't give us anything in part of the you know, comparables again, maybe they can't find anything I understand, but telling us about their home, telling, telling us about, about your location, location, it takes a few extra moments and may make the difference. So please take a few moments. You've got almost two months to go through and give some information of Part D that may make the difference between getting a reduction and not. Someone also asked whether we can use homes that are currently for sale as comparables. We tend not to lead on those because I could list my house for twenty kajillion dollars or list it for four hundred thousand dollars, but until it's sold, nothing is definitive. So typically, it's more along the lines of closed sales. That being said, we do ask for whether your house is on the market and whether or not it's in contract. But we also look at that, and it's not the end all be all. If your house is on the market for $400,000, we look at whether it's being listed at market value or if you're looking to just sell the home quickly, just as we would any other sale. So Someone what, asked an interesting question. They were curious how what percentage of uh, county homeowners go through the appeal process to appeal their assessment. Um, I know that last year we, we broke 200,000. There's 424,000 or so homes in Nassau County. So I think we are very close to 50% and it goes up every year. Someone asked a question somewhat similar to what I had answered before. If the house is in total disrepair, how is that taken into consideration? Well, again, if you feel that the condition is a factor, then take some photos of your home, type up a Word document, send the Word doc and the photos into us, and we can take a look. If you send things in, we're going to look at them. So it's not, you know, that we tell you to send attachments and then we blow it off. If you send in the attachments, we're going to take a look at them. If you send in an appraisal, we'll look at the appraisal. It's not a waste of time to do this thing. Someone also asked, if, if there, there was, was any benefit to not, not using Sales Locator to start, start the application process. Um, you know, using, using Sales Locator is optional is how I have to answer that. You are not required to provide us with any comparable sales in your appeal, and you are still legally entitled to the review. Um, I, I don't really know that there's any benefit to not using Sales Locator, but you do not, on the other hand, have to use sales uh, in part of your appeal. It's not required. Somebody had asked for the website address for the town of North Hempstead Tax Receiver's Office. I have posted that link in the Q&A. 
so it's available. You just have to click on it. Mr. Berman, is there anything you wanted to add at this point, or if you want to answer some of these questions, feel free to jump right in anytime well, I, you want. Yeah, I can't see the questions here, but okay. Uh, um, you know, I want to thank you, um, Robert and uh, Jason, um, for this presentation. You know, when I do this, um, you know, many times there are questions that really should be directed at Assessment Review Commission. So this time, you know, I'm, I'm so happy that, that you're here to answer them. Um, you know, I, uh, I just want to point out to people um, that they really do need to look their property up on mynassauproperty.com. Look at their property record card. You know, specifically look at the information about the square footage of their house. And look, there's also something that says CDU. That is the condition what Nassau yeah. County Department of Assessment has for your property. It stands for condition, desirability, and utility. Um, look at that and and you know, it may say it may say good and your condition is fair. Um, that's a significant factor that you really need to get changed. So it's more than just presenting information to the Assessment Review Commission about your, your condition of your property, because they may take that in consideration this year, but that will remain for future assessments. So going forward, they'll always pull comps that have other CDUs that are good. Um, so what you really need to do is follow up with Nassau County Department of Assessment and, you know, see if you get a get a field inspector to come and change the CDU of your property. There's also another factor that says grade. They do grade your property. So um, if for some reason, you know, you have an, an A, um, which would be for like a mansion, a waterfront property, um, and you, you're not, you need to get that changed. So you have to look very closely at your property record card. Um, and then if there is, you know, if there are some some major mistakes or other mistakes there, you can put that on your application um, to ARC in um, Section D, the section that Robert likes so much. <laughs> That's where you can put your other factors and you can put that information there and also send attachments. If you have, as, as Robert mentioned in the presentation, if you have an engineer's report that basically shows that you have cracks in the foundation of your house, that's a major factor. And you wanna get that changed at Department of Assessment and then also present that in your um, appeal uh, for this year. But the most important thing is if there are changes that have to be made ARC doesn't make them and they won't make them for you and they can't make them at assessment. You have to basically go back to assessment and get those fixed. So remember you're dealing with two agencies here. Department of Assessment that assigns the value to your property and this Assessment Review Commission, which is set up to hear grievances, to hear challenges to that assessment. Um, as far as SCAR, it is, it is technical. And, and you do need to have some expertise to go in there pro se. You're basically going to court representing yourself if you don't have, um, you know, professional help. So, um, you know, you really have to decide at that point. But, you know, the grievance period is now, the SCAR period for this year's assessment will be next April. But for anybody who filed a grievance last year, and lost at the Assessment Review Commission, you should know by now, um, and you wanna file a SCAR appeal, that's coming up in April of 2022. And you only have one month to do that. You have to get on the docket with, um, with the Nassau County Clerk, as Robert said, you have to contact the County Clerk if you wanna go to SCAR. Yeah, just... And you have to do that this April for last year's grievances. So, um, you know, there is a lot of information here, but I'm, I'm so happy that we heard from Assessment Review Commission today. Um, I wish I could always go to them live when I'm doing a live presentation, <laughs> but, but this was really um, very successful. Um, if you do have questions about SCAR, you can contact us. You can call my office. Um, you can ask to speak to uh, Orphie Miranda. 
um, she'd certainly be be able to answer your questions and give you guidance and direction. Um, and uh, you know, we we know that the process is complicated. Some people, you know, are able to do it very well. Once you learn how to do it online, the people who file um, these grievances every year, they always switch from paper to doing it online once they get the hang of it and get comfortable. So this was really beneficial to show us step by step how to do it online. I can't get into that much detail when I do my presentation, but um, I certainly do, do go into other things that will help you. So again, if you wanna watch my presentation too, before you file, um, it's on the um, Town of North Hempstead uh, website. You go to government, you go to receiver of taxes, you can see the grievance presentation. The only thing that changes are the years because the last time I did it was right before the pandemic hit in February of 2020. But all the other information is very up to date and accurate. Um, so again, I want to thank you. I want to thank everyone. I can't see the questions, but if you want to keep going and reading them, if there's any more that you know, I think I could add information. You handle the one. Absolutely, um, Mr. Berman. Um, the phone number for because you mentioned they could call Orphe. What phone number should they call? Because I'm going to put that in the Q and A. Five one one zero. Uh, it's area code five one six. 726-5110 is her direct number at her desk. 726-5110, and in case you're wondering what she sounds like, you may have heard her say it for <laughs> quick thinking in the background there. So that's, which is perfectly fine, Orphe. We love having you on here. Well, so, you okay, call. that number is in the uh, Q&A. Also, I put a direct link to the um, tax receiver's website, and there's also a direct link in the Q&A from mynassoproperty.com to go look up your property, as Mr. Berman said, very important to do so. Um, also, uh, if you do call the direct number, 516-869-7800, um, she is extension 5110. So either way. Gotcha, great. Thank you, Mr. Berman. We're gonna Thank take care of a couple more questions we had over here, so let's do that. Let's see, there was a question I wanted to address that had to do with finding sales of non-buildable lots, which is sort of specific, but it's still a lot of folks may have that. Um, sales locator only works for, for single family, two family and three family homes. Um, so it's not good for condos, co-ops or to locate lot sales. My suggestion to you is if you're looking to find land sales, would probably be to contact a local realtor who has access to multiple listing because you can look for non-buildable lots on multiple listing or a realtor may have access to public records to locate. Uh, it's not very easy to locate land sales in general. It's tougher to locate land sales for pieces of land where you can't build anything on them. It's just a vacant lot that pretty much can remain vacant. A lot of times it's based for privacy or for right away and stuff like that. Um, but to find land sales, you may want to speak to a professional just because even for, you know, professional appraisers, finding land sales can be a bit of a chore and it's not easy, so. Okay, uh, this is an interesting question that we get sometimes. Is the process different if you, if you live in a village? Uh, it may be. Your village may have its own process. The, the appeal, appeal process, process that you do with ARC takes care of the county and the schools. So, so if, if you live in a village, village I, would I would encourage you to contact your village and ask them if they have an additional or separate process, process because, because that's that's each village, village is different. Uh, someone mentioned uh, assessment being frozen here and if they still need to file a grievance. What I advise you to do is, regardless of a freeze, every year you are legally, legally entitled, entitled to appeal the assessment if you don't agree with the assessment. And, and that's, that's how, how I would explain that question. We had a question I wanted to address because someone was asking about the assessed value, the level of assessment, and so forth, and how the math all works out. I had a comment well, to, to that oh, last question. Mr. Berman, please do. 
I also, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to um, file one of these grievances every year, even if the tax roll is frozen. It's not really frozen because people are filing these appeals. You heard about 200,000. There's going to be a lot of reductions. So next year's assessment roll, a lot of people who get reductions will be lower. So the roll will be different. So essentially your share, your, if you don't file, your pro rata share of the tax levy will increase. And that means your tax bill would increase uh, proportionally. So um, you always do have a benefit of filing. Having a frozen tax roll doesn't mean that the taxes are frozen. The, the tax roll changes every single year. So please remember and tell everybody you know to make sure you file one of these grievances every year. Okay, Mr. Berman, you know how you said you wish you had us with you when you did your live seminars? We wish you had your explanation of that with us for most of the seminars because so many people don't understand the math and I understand it's very confusing and that's, you know, you're a professional. This is what you do for a living. So it, it is extremely helpful. Um, along those lines, someone again was asking about the level of assessment and so forth. And if you look at the screen on the right where it says assessment information, you'll notice at the bottom it says taxable market value $467,000. And below that it says assessed value 467. How that math works out is you take the taxable market value and you multiply it by the level of assessment and you'll notice right above that it says what the level of assessment is 0 0.001 you do the math and you come out with the assessed value of 467 that 467 is what is multiplied by the tax rates to come up with your town your county and your school taxes so that's how the math works on that so in theory if you get a lower taxable market value leading to a lower assessed value it will lead to you paying less than you would have if you had not gotten that reduction. Again, each year is taken separately. So you can't say, well, I paid $10,000 in taxes last year. I got a reduction. I should be paying less than $10,000 this year. That's not the way the math works. Each year is taken as a separate case. It's very important to understand that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. I believe that we have uh, answered the majority of the questions. Uh, if a question was very specific to your property, we can't cover that in a public setting. It wouldn't be right. So you could always call us if you have a question about your specific issue and call the assessment of your commission at 571-3214. Well, let's go ahead and do a last call for questions to see uh, if uh, anything else comes in that uh, folks have saved that might be of benefit for everyone. Yes, and a reminder that all of our contact information is on the screen, it's in the Q&A, and very important because the guys in customer service tell me this. I know it says office hours are 9 a.m. to 445, but they typically take their last calls at 430, so they have time to answer any questions they have. So if you call like at 444, Hoping to get our staff, there's a good chance they're already helping others and you're going to get voicemail. So if you're calling our customer service staff, and they are great, by the way, I have to say Jason's a prime example of how wonderful these women and men are. Just um, give them a call. They are also able to help you if you're doing your actual appeal and you're talking, you know, you're on the computer and you get stuck at something and it's during office hours. Give them a call. They may be able to help you get to that next step. Uh, again, 516-571-3214 is our phone number. You can also visit our website. Our website has plenty of information, including a frequently asked questions section, which answers not only things we've covered, but a lot of stuff we haven't covered today. So if you have a question that didn't get answered or you thought about it afterwards, check out our frequently asked questions section of our website, and it may have the answers that you are looking for and if you look at the screen, it's right on the left hand side. It says frequently asked questions. You can just click on that link and get to that page. Robert, could I add one other thing? Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to point out that this is also the grievance period for anybody who filed for an exemption last year in 2021 and got denied. Um, you're allowed to appeal that decision as well. So um, you do have to file uh, a separate form with Nassau County Assessment Review Commission. 
Also, anybody who thinks that they're in the wrong class of property, this is pretty unusual, but there are four classes of property in Nassau County. Class one are the residential properties, that would be one, two, or three family homes. Class two properties are mostly co-op and condos. These are the tall apartment houses that have been converted over the years, four stories or higher. Class three properties are utilities. And class four properties are commercial properties. But if you're home, you have to look at your, your um, notice of tentative assessment. It'll tell you what class your property is being assessed in. If for some reason you think you're in the wrong class, this is a time to file an appeal for that. You have to appeal that. Also contact the Nassau County Department of Assessment. Um, so this is the grievance period. Mostly people use it to grieve um, the assessment that was assigned to their property, but also this is the period where you would appeal those other issues. Great, thank you, Mr. Berman. Great information. Um, you know, like Jason mentioned before, we never speak on behalf of other departments, um, but you don't have those restrictions, so it's great that you can cover a lot of the material that technically we're not supposed to be covering. So it's, I'm very glad that you stuck around, you answered a whole bunch of questions, questions that were being asked you didn't even know because you couldn't see that part of the screen. So that's why I'm glad you stuck around. It's extremely helpful. Um, again, this video will be up on the town of North Hempstead's website probably within the next 24 hours we'll get it up processed and over to them as quickly as we can um i want to thank we get some really nice comments about the the rapport that our staff has doing these seminars i truly i know it sounds strange i truly enjoy doing these because it gives me a chance to help people and not everyone's job allows them the opportunity to help the public but in this case it does so it, you know makes it part of the job fun so I think we've covered all the questions. So I think we're gonna wrap up the presentation. I wanna thank Mr. Berman again for inviting us to speak to his constituents. I wanna thank Supervisor DeSena for joining us as well. If you have any future questions, again, call our customer service, reach out to Mr. Berman's office. The phone numbers are available on their website. At this point, I wanna thank you all for joining us. I wanna wish you all a very pleasant day. And again, the deadline is May 2nd, 2022. Please do not wait until the last minute to file. Get it done as soon as possible. Mr. Berman, any final comments or? Thank you. I, I just want to thank uh, you again, Robert and Jason, for all your help this morning. Um, I think it was very informative and helpful to, uh, to the constituents. And um, again, if anybody has any questions, they, they can reach out to us as well. So, um, you know, Looking forward to seeing everybody and, uh, you know, I want to uh, wish everybody um, uh, uh, a, a good new year and to stay healthy. Thank you very much, Mr. Berman. Thank you all for joining us. And I also wish you a happy and healthy day. Take care. Thank you.